I want you to open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 30, verse 9. Now, I'm going to be turning to some scriptures here like we did last week. If it's, if it's too many for you to turn to, do your best to write these references down somewhere so you can look them up later. I'm going to go from Isaiah to Daniel to Luke. From Isaiah to Daniel to Luke. So there's three that you can sort of f find the place where they are in, in your Bible. But I'm going to start with Isaiah chapter 30, verse 9. Now, this is scriptures on getting your prayers answered. We need to have our faith built on, on, from scriptures that tells us about getting our prayers answered. We know all about how to pray, but we need to know about getting our prayers answered. Now, a lot of times people just don't understand what the Bible says about it. But I want you to go to Isaiah 30, verse, verse 19. It says, The people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. They shall weep no more. What I want you to really see is this. God will be very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry. When he shall hear it, he will answer thee. Now I want you to see this. This is awesome. The Bible says when you voice your cry to God in prayer, it is at that moment God hears you. You don't have to wait and beg and plead in six weeks. The Bible says when you voice your cry is the time when he hears it. At the voice of thy cry, when he shall hear it, he will answer thee. He hears it then at the voice of thy cry. The Bible says he answered thee. Now, last Wednesday night, I gave the scripture in 1 John chapter 5 about when we know that he hears us, then we also know that we have what we ask him for. And the Bible says he hears us when we cry. At the, vo at the very voicing of your cry, that's when he hears it. That's when we know that if we understand the scriptures, that's when we can know that God has heard uh, affirmatively, and that's when we can begin to build a case of faith to God about that's why I ought to have what I ask. I know you heard me. Are y'all out there? Now I want you to go to the book of Daniel chapter 9. The book of Daniel chapter 9. And I want you to see some things here. I want to look at verse 19 following. The, the, the problem here is these people are in captivity. And verse 19 says, O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not. In other words, I never tell somebody to put a prayer limit, a, a time limit on God. Now look what Daniel does. He said, don't defer this thing. In other words, he's saying do exactly what I said I don't ever tell anybody to do. Well, Daniel, is, you know, I'm not in his pay grade yet. Y'all out there? He's a pay grade ahead of me here. But he prayed, Lord, defer not. And he comes to this thing and he says, uh, for thine own sake, for the city's sake, for the people's sake that are called by thy name. So he says, defer not based on all these things. And then he says in verse 20, he said, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of God, while I was speaking in prayer, verse 21, the man Gabriel, he thought he was a man, Gabriel is, a, is an archangel, whom, he, whom, had, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. In other words, while he was speaking to God at the time of the evening prayer, this angel, Gabriel, touched him. Now let's pause. My wife had a real experience with an angel in, her, in, in the bedroom one time. I was sound asleep and didn't know a thing about it. But she had this, uh, this, it was either an angel or it was Jesus. One way or the other, it absolutely changed her life and turned it wrong side out. She will never forget that. And she always goes back to that when she needs to reach way back and get a hold of God and remember something. She remembers this. I have had angels follow me around, warring angels, 
two of them, about seven feet tall with tremendous wingspan. And I was not even aware of what, that angels really are supposed to have wings, but they do. These did, and people have seen these things. When my back would be against a wall in, in, in something I was doing, and the devil was trying to put me out of business, these things would stand on me, one on both sides of me, and they'd put their wings out, and they'd touch in the middle, and I'd be under where they touched. I've had numerous people see that. I have never seen them. But here is this Gabriel. He thought it was a man. The Bible says Gabriel is an angel. And while he was praying at the evening oblation, while he was voicing his prayer to God about the people and the mountain and the city, all of that, the Bible says Gabriel was caused to fly swiftly, and he touched me about the time of the evening oblation, which is when I was speaking to God in prayer. Are you all out there? So what have we here? Wednesday night, I shared some scriptures about God does it immediately. He can go into gear instantly. Here's two more. Here's two more. But I want you to notice something here. Let's keep going. Verse 22, and he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. And at the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Are y'all getting this? Do y'all see this? Now I want you to see something else here. I got a page stuck. Bear with me for just a minute. He came to tell him he's going to do something. Now go to chapter 10. Beginning at verse 10, he came to tell him, and you're going to get some answers here, but nothing happened. But then in verse 10, he said, Behold, a hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright. For unto thee am I now sent, and when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Verse 12 says, Gabriel said, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But now here we had a delay. He said, Defer not. He knew that, he heard, that this, this Gabriel came and touched him and said, You're going to get something here, but there's a span of three weeks, nothing happened. And here we find out why. He said, verse 13, chapter 10, The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. In other words, there was a demon force that stopped me from getting there for 21 days. Now, brother, listen to me. If there is a demonic force that can slow Gabriel down for 21 days, that's a powerful force against you. If, in fact, this kind of force is arrayed against us, how can we ever hope to deal with it in the flesh? How can we ever hope to deal with a demonic force powerful enough to slow Gabriel down for 21 days to stop him from answering uh, the instructions of God to answer Daniel's prayer? Let's go on. But, lo, Michael, we have two of these, Michael and Gabriel, these are the archangels, for Israel, he said, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. In other words, Gabriel had to call up reinforcements. Sometimes you have to have some help out there. Sometimes you're battling something bigger than you are. Sometimes your wits won't make it. Sometimes your money won't buy your way through it. Sometimes your social position won't help you. Sometimes, brother, you have to have not only Gabriel, but you have to have Michael come down there and help Gabriel to shut the whole mess down where God can do something. Are y'all out there? So he said, at the end of 21 days, Michael came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. But now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for the vision is yet for many days. What I want you to see here is this. He was touched when he prayed in the evening oblation. God touched him out. He knew that things, things were going to happen. But there was a 21-day lifespan. Are you listening? 21-day span there that nothing happened. How come? 
It was a 21-day thing there because it was a demonic counterattack on the part of the devil, and he used this king of Persia. Are you listening to me out there? So even God was backed up for 21 days. I don't understand that, but I don't have to understand it. I have to tell you what it says. God had his angel Gabriel in there, and he finally sent Michael in there to give him support, and the two of them broke through. Are you listening today? If you're out there, wave your hands at me, okay? So here we find an immediate hearing, but a 21-day delay. So when Daniel said, defer not, he got it both ways. It was deferred, even though he touched him on the first day. He touched him at the very time of his prayer, but it was nevertheless deferred, which tells us what? Sometimes I can know in my spirit, man, that God has heard my prayer, but sometimes there is a delay. Maybe it's God doing it. Maybe it's the devil doing it. But nevertheless, when I know that God has heard me, I am going to give God time to work his way through where he can deal with me in such a way that he does what I ask him when he promises me in his word that it belongs to me. Are you all listening to me? In other words, Daniel experienced a delay, and it took some mighty mighty angels, archangels, to come down here and make the things happen that God had intended to happen here. So we find Isaiah, when I prayed, I got the answer. I knew he heard me. Daniel knew it, and he said, defer not, but God deferred it, or else he had to defer it because this king of Persia got in the way, but he sent in there Gabriel and Michael, and he broke through with this thing. Are y'all out there? In other words... I don't go by how long it takes God to answer my prayer. I know when I've I know when God's heard me when I pray. When I've heard him, when I know he's heard me, I know that somewhere down the road I'm going to get the answer that I heard him heard, that I was aware he heard me pray. Are y'all with me? I also gave you Wednesday night to get real prayer going with God. You have to pray a scripture. You learn to pray a scripture. You find a scripture. You read this Bible broadly. You under, start underlining promises that God made to you. And brother, whenever it's time for you to pray, when you got your back against the wall, you won't start. You won't be thinking about your wits and what you can do. You're going to be getting back in the Word and finding out what does the Word say God's going to do for you when you ask Him. Are you out there? So once I know that, the fact that there's a delay doesn't bother me. That delay is usually the will of God working through some things that if you worked it through any faster would be bad on somebody in your life or you. So I don't worry about is there a, a delay. Are y'all with me out there? Matter of fact, turn to the book of Luke chapter 18. Let's talk about that delay business one more time. Luke 18. Is everybody with me? If you can't turn and find it as fast as I go with it, write the, write the reference down, please. So we find here in Luke chapter 18, Jesus spoke a parable unto them to this end. That man ought always to pray and not to faint. Men ought to pray always and not to faint at it. In other words, don't get slack. Don't go to sleep on it, but keep praying till the answer comes. And here's a parable to illustrate that statement. He said, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. There was a widow in that city also, and she came unto him, saying, Judge, avenge me of my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward, he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, Yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. In other words, I don't care one thing about that woman. I don't care one thing about her problem. But she's bugging me. If I don't give her what she wants, I never will get rid of her. You see that? Lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, verse 6, Hear what the unjust judge saith. We heard it. She bugs me, and I'm going to give her what she wants to get rid of her. Hear what he said. 
And then verse 7 says, And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? Now get this. He said, Shall not God, yes, God shall avenge his own elect. Who are the elect? You are and I am. If you've been saved, you are the elect. So the Bible says if that unjust judge did it to get rid of this person, how much more will God avenge his elect? Because we don't get on his nerves. He loves us. That woman got on that judge's nerves because he did not love her. Have you ever been had to deal with the world and you knew they didn't love you? They didn't give a rip about you. They could care less what happens to you. That's the situation that poor woman was in. She was a widow. She had nobody else to turn to. She had to go to the magistrate. She had to go to the judge. But that judge could care less about that poor old woman. Are you all listening? So he finally gave her what she wanted to get rid of her. God does not give you what you want to get rid of you. He does not want to get rid of you. You are his child. There is no daddy worth the bullet it takes to blow him into kingdom come worth that bullet, brother, that's worth his salt if he wouldn't do the same thing for one of his kids. God is our father. We are his elect. Difference in these kind of kids and our kind of kids, God got to pick them. We didn't. We just had them. God picks his. We are his elect. Do you hear me? Which means he set his mind and his heart on you and me. He picked us. We are his elect. He is our father. He picked us. He loves us. He does not want to get rid of us. We never get on his nerves. We are his ch children. So the Bible says here shall not God avenge that kind of kid? You better believe it. And he said, even though they cry day and night unto him, Though he bear long with them. Get that expression. Though God bears long with us. How many times as a child of God have we been in the things we shouldn't have been in over and over and over. And God bears long with us. He just waits and waits and waits for us to do better as it were. He bears with us. But even though he bears with us. The Bible says in verse 8, I tell you, God will avenge his elect speedily. Do you see that? Now, there's a day coming in the which Jesus Christ will judge this world. And there's a lot of wrongs that's going to be righted at that day. Are you all listening to me? I don't have to avenge myself. The Bible says, vengeance is mine. I'll repay, saith the Lord. And I've seen that. People come against me that do ugly things. I used to want to get back at them, but I don't anymore. I just, I just keep cool, back up, watch, and let God. God will avenge you. He bears along with us, but he will avenge us even though we're not the best Christian. He will still avenge us. The day is coming when God will pay back people for us. Are you all out there? So we have, he hears immediately. But sometimes there's a delay. But even though there's a delay, once you know he's heard you, you're going to have what you prayed. 1 John chapter 5, you're going to have what you prayed. The Bible says if we know that he hears us when we pray, I have to know that he's heard. I don't have to know that he's going to give it to me. All I have to know is that God heard me. What will he hear? He will hear when you pray a scripture. God always hears when you pray his word because what you're doing is you're praying what he said. If you're praying what he said, he hears that. He may not hear my babble, but he hears what he said when it comes from my lips. So I pray what he said. I find a promise and I pray that. Hallelujah is right. When I pray that, I know he's heard. And when I know he's heard, somewhere I'm going to get what I ask. It may be 21 days. It may be right then. But I'm going to get what I ask for. Are you listening to me? So he said, I, God will avenge them speedily if that's my prayer. Is that I need help to protect me from some devil out there. Now I want to take three Bible examples of men that prayed. First, I want you to go to the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah. Now, this is a strange man, this Jonah. 
Look at the last verse in chapter 1. Book of Jonah. Jonah and the belly of the fish. Somebody says that's a whale. I cannot find the word whale in it. It's just a big fish. Well, the biggest fish we can think of is a whale. Well, God might have prepared one bigger than that for Jonah. Or it might have been littler. But the point is, he had a fish big enough to hold Jonah. Y'all out there? Here in verse 17, the last verse of chapter 1 says, The Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Now, why did he do that? Because God said to Jonah, Jonah, I want you to go over there to Nineveh, and I want you to preach repentance. Jonah said, I don't want to. I've said that myself a thousand times. I, said, I ain't going to do that. I always regret it, but I've said it. You have too, haven't you? We all have. Lord, I don't want to do that. But we always wind up doing it, either that or get our nose bloody. God will give you a bloody nose. Did you know that? Well, Jonah is getting his bloody nose here. So he's, he's supposed to go to Nineveh and preach, but he didn't do it. Here's what happened. He got on a boat to, to, to go the other way and get away from God and Nineveh. And then the Bible says, now, the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Well... Moral of that story, don't tell God you ain't going to do it. <laughs> He'll put you in jail way down deep. Well, look at verse 1, chapter 2. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord. <laughs> then Jonah prayed. Well, he didn't seem to have much time for it before when things were looking good. But all of a sudden, things don't look so good. It's like that fellow that... Going down the road one day, and he saw this beautiful white horse. This was a very rich man. He said, I got to have that white horse. So he wheeled around, and he pulled over in this fellow's yard. And this fellow that owned that horse didn't speak good English. And the man said, I want to buy that white horse. That's the prettiest horse I ever saw. He said, I got to have that horse. And this man said, no, he don't look so good. And the fellow said, no, to himself, it don't look so good. He said, that's the prettiest thing I ever saw. He said, well, what do you take for him? He said, oh, I won't sell him to you. He don't look so good. That guy kept saying to himself, that's the prettiest horse I ever saw in my life. And so he kept saying, I want to buy that horse. What do you take for him? He said, I'm telling you, he don't look so good. And this guy finally just burned out and said, that's the prettiest animal I ever saw. What will you take for him? Well, so the guy sold him. So the fellow sent his trucks back to load that horse up took him out to his ranch, and next day this he loaded him up on the trailers again and carried him back over where he bought him and said, I want my money back. And the guy said, well, why do you want your money back? He said, because that horse is blind as a bat. He said, I told you, he don't look so good. <laughs> well, inside that fish's belly, things don't look so good, do they? So Jonah decided to pray. When all else is down the tubes, pray, right? And thank God that God lets us do it that way. We shouldn't, but he, he does. So Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his God, out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord. Now he's recognizing he really has an affliction. Now I tell you what, I have been whipped and chastised and beat up and bloodied and banged up but I have never been stuck in the belly of a big fish. Anybody here ever had that? If you'll read this chapter, he talks about the weeds being wrapped around his head. He was down there in the seawater and seaweeds and everything else in the belly of that fish. Now, that was not a very pleasant home. I believe I'd have had to call the plumber over that deal. Are y'all out there? Notice, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord. And get this. And he heard me. Jonah's nine-tenths home right there. Jonah knew when God heard him. And I bet you that was one glad thing that he realized. I cried and he heard. John says, 1 John 5, when we know God's heard us, we can also know that we're going to have what we ask. Now, he's got some things to ask here. 
And he knew when he prayed, somehow he knew God heard him. And here's, here's the rest of it. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For Jonah, the, the interior of that fish was hell to him. I can understand his language. Can, can you? I can understand that. I cried out of the belly of hell, and thou heardest my voice. And then look at verse 10. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon dry land. What I get from this passage about Jonah, God dealt with Jonah and delivered Jonah from an absolute impossible set of circumstances. As long as my brain will work and I can think my way through and I say, I can do this or I can do that or I can do this over here or I can call so-and-so and I can call so-and-so and those two or three, they can help me as long as there's any of that left. My prayers really don't have the punch they ought to have. It's when I'm absolutely at my wit's end. It's absolutely when nothing human can be done. Then God comes through, and he will help you in circumstances impossible to your mind to ever get out of. I learned this early on in my Christian experience because I was backed into a corner from which there was no escape, no way. And I had nothing in front of me but to dump it on God and cry out like Jonah did. When I cried out in spite of the impossibleness of my circumstances, I knew God heard me. And when I knew he heard me, it was only a matter of hours. The answer came, and I was totally out of the mess. I have been inside the belly of the fish. Just not this one, but one that was as impossible as that one. Do you understand? So the Bible says God spoke to the fish, his circumstances, and made that thing throw Jonah up on dry land. Wasn't a long process, just fish, do it. And that fish was on the shore, and he did it. Impossible. You got to learn 1 John 5. When we know that God heard our prayer, then we also know that we have present tense even before we see it. We have what we ask for before it manifests. When Jonah heard, when Jonah knew that God heard him, I believe Jonah knew he was fixing to get upchucked on dry land. And sure enough, he did. Now, had he been in there and kept on not listening for God, how do you, how do you hear God? How do you hear the Holy Ghost? People have written books on it. I can put that thing into just less than a half a dozen sentences. You hear God when you shut your mouth and be quiet. Then, in stillness, God speaks to you on the inside. A lot of times people hear the audible voice of God. I have never heard that. I get inner knowings from God. I know things on the inside of me that I don't know in my brain, but I know stuff. That's the Holy Ghost. But if I'm not listening, that still small voice can't penetrate the dark atmosphere in which we live. We have to get quiet and be still and know that I am God. Jonah was where God could get through to him. Lots of times we wind up in, in a big mess because we won't listen. We don't want to listen. We don't want to give God a chance to say something. Are you out there? God puts us in the belly of some kind of a fish. Well, we have to listen. And when we're where Jonah was, brother, we, when we cry out, we, don't, we put our hand to our ear and we start listening. The only thing is, God's not usually speaking to that ear. He's speaking to the ears of my heart, of our spirit man. And you'll get an inner knowing. I know inside me when I prayed something whether God heard it to start with or not. But, brother, when I know that, I know that I already have what I asked for, even though I've not been vomited up on dry land yet. I know that it's coming. 
So I start tearing the seaweeds from around my face so I can see what color the sand is when I get there. Isn't that great? Now that's how this thing works. God's always talking. And so the Lord spake unto the fish. Brother Jay, how did he speak to that fish? He probably said, if you don't do this now, I'm going to send a guy down here with a big hook. And you're going to be on somebody's table tonight. <laughs> so that fish said, okay, I'm convinced. Point is, God got rid of Jonah out of that, got, got Jonah out of that thing. Are y'all listening to me? Now let me let me give you give you another thing here. I want you to go to the book of Ezra and also the book of Nehemiah. There's another thing. When I was coming up as a young Christian, I used to hear sermons on this subject. You need to put some feet to your prayers. That's true. That means I got to pray. Here's what it means. It means I have to pray like it's up to God, but I have to put my hand to the plow like it's up to me. You listening to me. I prayed like I had nothing to do with it, but I put my hand to the plow and began to plow like God wasn't even on the scene. So you have to put feet to your prayer. Now, is that a fact? Is that Bible? Yes, it is. I'm going to give you some principles here. First of all, I want you to go to Ezra chapter 8. And I'm a little bit ahead of myself. Ezra, I want to talk about Ezra introduced something else to prayer. Jesus said to the disciples one time, there's a couple of them couldn't get a man healed. And the man's daddy went to, the, went to Jesus and said, how come they can't get that done? Well, Jesus went ahead and spoke the word and healed them. And he said, how come they couldn't get my son healed, my, my kinfolk healed? And Jesus said, some of this stuff only comes out by fasting and prayer. Fasting. Sometime we need to add fasting to what we pray or when we pray. Now, in the book of Ezra, chapter 8, look at verse 21. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Hava. We might afflict ourselves before our God to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all our substance. Now, Ezra and Nehemiah were sent from Babylon. They'd been down there 70 years in bondage, slaves. But God was loosing them, letting them go back into Jerusalem and start to rebuild. And so when they went back there to rebuild, things were a mess, and they had all kinds of enemies over there to try to keep them from it, just like today. And so they start to seek God, seek, a, seek of God a right way for them to approach God and to carry out this job he gave them, which is to rebuild uh, the wall and the temple. And he said, for our, for our little ones and for all our substance and all for our families. Verse 22 said, I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in, this, in the way. Because we had spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him. But his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. Now, I want you to notice something here. When they were leaving Babylon, the king said, I'll give you anything you want. I'll give you armed guards. Well, Undoubtedly, their faith might have got a little bit of weakness. They said, well, if we ask for all that, they might just change their minds. That's too much trouble. Just stay here. So he said, I hesitated now to tell the king we need help. Because these people are going to kill us if we touch this wall, this ruins, and this town, and the temple. They don't want us to mess with this. They don't want us to rebuild. So he said, I need God to help me because I went out on a limb and I said, our God is with us. And we start this saying, if anybody comes against us, God's going to deal with them. Now, I'm going to have to write back and get an armed guard from that heathen king. That's what he's in here. He said, I was ashamed to require the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy. Because we had spoken to the king saying, the hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him. But his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. So here's what they did. So we fasted, verse 23, and besought our God for this. And in so doing, he was entreated of us. Ezra introduced fasting to a necessary prayer. Sometimes when, brother, you can't get through the mess and the muck 
and the demonic hordes that stand between you and heaven, sometimes a fast will break that thing. They said to Jesus, how come those disciples could not heal this person? Jesus said, that kind only comes through with prayer, prayer and fasting. Same thing here. He fasted and he prayed. He besought God in the form of a fast. That's what he meant when he said, we're going to afflict ourselves. They fasted and prayed. Are y'all out there? And sure enough, the answer came in result of prayer combined with fasting. Are you listening to me? Now, let me show you one more. Book of Nehemiah. It's the next little book over. Nehemiah chapter 4. Let's look at verse 7. Ezra, Nehemiah in your Bible. It's the next book over. Start turning the pages from the right to the left, and you'll get there. So now Nehemiah's on the scene. He's over there, and his job's to build the walls of Jerusalem. When he got there, verse 7 says, but it came to pass, there's a couple of guys over there, Sanballat and Tobiah, the Arabian and the Ammonite. And the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped, and they were very wroth and conspired all of them together, together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Nevertheless, verse 9 said, We made our prayer unto our God and set a watch against him day and night because of them. Now here's where we put our hands to the plow. We put feet to our prayers. We join in with, the full, with God in the fulfillment of our prayer. Are you all with me? Watch how they did it. We made our prayer unto God. But then we set a watch against him day and night because of them. In other words, God, I'm praying to you, but I'm going to keep my eyes on that bunch. You getting this? I'm praying to God, but I'm going to keep my eyes on that bunch. But that's not all. Let's go on down further in the chapter. Verse 17. Well, verse 16. Well, verse 15. It came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known unto us, and God had brought their counsel to naught. In other words, God brought the, 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 the counsel and the plan and the conspiracy of Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites. God had just confused and brought their plans to naught so that they, wouldn't, they couldn't get through to them and bother them about rebuilding the wall. And verse 15 said, When our enemies heard that it was known unto us and God had brought their counsel to naught, that we returned all of us to the wall and every one to his, unto his work. But get this, and it came to pass, verse 16, from that time forth. In other words, I prayed to God like it was all up to him, but I'm still keeping my eye on that bunch. You got me. He's putting feet to his prayer. Verse 16, it came to pass from that time forth that half of my servants wrought in the work, and the other half of them held both the spears, the shields, the bows, and the habergians, and the rulers were behind all the house of Israel. In other words, half the people worked. The rest of them had their armor. They were armed to the teeth, keeping their eyes on them. They're getting set to put feet to their prayers. God, you're the one doing this. But in case something slips a little, we'll take up the slack. I've always been a take up the slack kind of fella. Y'all hearing me? Doesn't mean I don't trust God. It just means that sometimes God looks to me to do this, that, and the other while he's handling the big picture. Then verse 17, they which build it on the wall and they that bear burdens with those that laid it, that is the bricklayers, every one with one of his hands wrought in the work and with the other hand held a weapon. Those bricklayers had a trowel in one hand and a spear in the other, brother. And he went at it with one hand, but he kept his eyes. He put feet to his prayer. Are you seeing this? Are you all out there? So what we find here is a bunch of scriptures that helps us understand how to go about getting our prayers answered. God answers prayer. Sometimes you have to fast along with the prayer to get it done. Sometimes you have to keep your 
powder dry, as they said in the old days. Sometimes you have to keep one hand on the plow, and the other hand over there doing what you're supposed to be doing, but you put feet to the prayers, you're prepared for whatever comes. It may be God wants, just like Jericho. They were going in there taking the promised land. There's this place called Jericho. They sent word in there and said, we want to pass by peaceably. Let us pass by. There'll be no harm come to you. Well, Jericho, Jericho wanted to fight. Well, Moses went to God and said, what do I do? And here's what God said. He said, you don't fight, but you're going to go through the motions. I want you to get the trumpet players and praise team out there, and they're going to go around those walls out there around Jericho seven days. And on the seventh day, I'm going to make those walls fall flat. Then you're going to go in there and you're going to take it. So what they do? They had to go out there and fight. They had to go out there and send the praise team around, the trumpet players. They went out there, toot. <laughs> you need to get some trumpets up away and go toot. Those guys went around there, toot. Well, these people in Jericho lined the walls of that town, looking down there to see this crazy bunch they thought had a sunstroke or something. All they could do is get out there and blow that horn. Toot. But brother, on the seventh day, those walls crumbled right beneath them. And then they went in there and took the thing with, just took it over. When they were taking the promised land, it was a promise and a prayer, but they had to put feet to the prayers. God said, I want you to do some stuff. He said, I'm going to give you the victory. The victory is assured in advance. I'm telling you, this thing is won. But you know what? You're going to have to do some fighting. I'll give you the victory, but you're going to have to fight to get that victory. But I've assured you it's going to happen. And here are three words. He said, I want you to go in there. I want you to take them. I want you to smite them. And I want you to destroy them. So what does he do? He sticks them on two giants in that thing. Old Sihon and Og. And Og, that guy, that guy was 14 feet tall. He was a big dude. Well, they went in there and they took that. They, they, they took them, they smited them, they destroyed them. Why? Because God said, I'm going to do it. But this is how it's going to be done. You're going to have to put feet to your prayers. So what I'm saying to you is this morning, there comes a time when you have to put feet to your prayers. I could have sat out there and got in front of one of these hotels, got there and said, Lord, Sunday morning, I'm begging you to send me a whole big bunch of people. I ain't putting no ad in no paper. Nobody knows my name in this end of town. Nevertheless, I'm gonna, I know you want a church in there, and I, we're going to start that thing, but I'm going to sit here on my duff while you bring in this multitude. Doesn't work like that always. He had me send out letter after letter after letter. How many of y'all remember getting letters from me? I said, the Macedonian call is now. Remember that bunch in Macedonia sent word to Paul, come over here and help us. Brother, I sent letters on that very theme. And sure enough, first Sunday, we had a bunch of folk in there. We come out here now, we're running 100. Y'all listening. That ain't bad. Think on it. Some things, you have to put feet to your prayer. God said in that Old Testament, take them. Smite them and destroy them. Jericho, you march around that thing seven days, blow that trumpet, get the praise team out there and praise God. And I'll handle them walls. And then when I knock them down, you go in there and take that place. Are y'all getting this? Sometimes you have to put feet to your prayer. The point is prayer is how we get stuff done. We don't get it done with the tools of the world. We do it in the power of God. Are y'all getting this? Lord, in the name of Jesus, I'm asking you to bless us and teach us about prayer. Lord, help us not to shrink. Help us to be like Jonah before we ever get in the belly of that fish. Help us, oh Lord, just do what you said. Do what you told us to do so that we don't have to go into that belly, the belly of that fish. Just help us to learn from him, but don't be like him. But if we ever get into it, help us, Lord, to go ahead and cry out unto you from the belly of hell so you can say something to that fish and get us out of there. Lord, help us to know that comes a time we have to fast. Comes a time we have to put feet to our prayer. We have to cover all bases that God hadn't because sometimes he leaves a bunch of bases to us to cover. Whatever 
just reveal it to us and build our faith right now, Lord, in prayer, about prayer, through the preaching, through the teaching of the Word of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Is there anybody in this place that's had a prayer you've been praying, but you